it seems totally normal to listen to a podcast about the Toronto Argonauts. It's the X's and Argos podcast. Welcome to the X's and Argos podcast brought to you by Funny Bone Broth. My name is Ben Grant, joined as always by JB. We've got a jam-packed week for you. We are going to focus on the defensive backs this week. We've also got some news this week, which <laughs> is never a guarantee at this time of year. Some some negative, actually quite a bit of negative, but also some positive. So maybe we'll come out with the negative first, go into the positive, and then hit you with our defensive back analysis. So, JB, the bad news. We heard this past week from both the province of Ontario and the city of Toronto Neither one looking like there are going to be fans in stands at Argos games or Red Blacks or Ty Cats games for that matter at any point this summer. Yeah, it's not it's not great news. Clearly, Toronto has information that makes them uncomfortable about running any outdoor activity. The fact that they've already preemptively canceled every outdoor activity from now until the end of July is, uh, you know, I think a little bit discouraging and uh, concerning because, you you know, you wonder why is Toronto canceling this? They, they clearly are getting medical advice that we should not have large collections of people outdoors. So it, it doesn't feel like this is going to change in the next three or four months looks like you're looking at no crowds and that's a done deal. And now the question will be, how will the Argos react to that? And how will the league react to that? And I don't think that these are, let's wait and see how it goes. It sounded from the language that we got, it sounded like this is maybe not written in stone, but it's written in Sharpie and that stuff's hard to get out. So It's a situation where the province came down and said no sporting events this summer. And then Toronto the very next day up that all the way to September 6th. And we got to remember that the league had pegged August 5th as a potential kickoff date. So if we bring up the calendar and look at what that would mean. So if we're kicking off August 5th and Toronto can't play a home game till the week of September 6th. So that's that's a Monday. So let's say we're not playing till till September 10th, we're talking about week six of the CFL season. So even if you factor a buy in there, is it at all realistic to have the Argonauts, the Tiger Cats, the Red Blacks to play five straight road games out West before kicking off their home schedule? I I just don't, I don't see that happening. No, I I don't either. I I think... In, in my opinion, they're just going to have to accept having games with no fans. I, I don't see any other way around it. It's just going to have to be a province by province thing where some teams will get to have home fans and some teams won't. And much like the NHL playoffs, some states have fans and some states don't. And you just have to roll with it. And I think that's what what the CFL is going to have to do. The, the Argos are not going to be allowed to have fans in my opinion, this year. And it is impossible to hold out hope. I think that caution is the term of the, of, of the, of the time. Toronto is definitely highly cautious and wants to make sure that everything is in the rear view. So they're just going to have to accept no fans this year and, 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 and move on with it. And I think like you're saying, I don't think the province and the city are going to say, no, these events can happen. But like you're saying, they're going to say, no, no fans can watch these events. Sort of like what, you know, what we've, what we've seen go on in a lot of these places in the States with no fans in the stands. But the difference here is that the league has come out and basically said, look, we're not playing until we can get fans in seats. And so we're at an impasse here. Is it that we have to delay until there are fans in seats, and then what happens if that never occurs? What if Toronto never gives the league the okay to put uh, fans in seats? What if the 
the provincial government never gives them the okay to put fans in seats? Does it keep getting postponed until there isn't any football anymore? I, I just don't see that happening after all these promises were made. I think it, this may come back to another bubble situation where the entire league is going to be playing out West and it's just going to be that there are no home games for any of the East teams or at least any of the Ontario teams. Yeah, I mean, that feels even more radical. I feel the the most straightforward scenario is simply to to get the okay to play games without fans and and that's just how it has to go for the Argos and when they travel out west there will be fans and when they play in Toronto there won't be fans and if that's unacceptable then they should shut it down now. I I don't believe they should wait until August to see if anything has changed. Uh you know, these are these are issues that are not going to change on a week by week basis. Um, there, there are concerns. Uh, we are not a fully vaccinated country like the Americans, and the reality is is that caution is 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 what is ruling right now, and the league just has to accept that and move on and make a decision. Right now, we're fine with no fans or we're going to cancel the season. I I don't think they should hope for a change because the city is not going to give in. The city is not going to change their mind. And to think that things are going to be radically different in September is a pipe dream, in my opinion. If I had to guess right now what is going to happen, the only team I feel, the only team I don't really have a sense for at all is Montreal. But... I think the three Ontario teams are going to okay the idea of playing without fans. I think when it comes down to it and a decision has to be made and the teams in the West are given permission to have 5,000, 10,000, whatever it is, people in the stands and Ontario doesn't have permission to have anyone in the stands, I think the three Ontario teams will say, you know what, let's let's go ahead with it. I believe that, that they'll do that. Now, if they don't, I still don't think that is going to put an end to things. If they don't, what I think that's going to mean is that, okay, let's say, let's say, let's say Toronto, Hamilton, Ottawa, I'll say, no, we don't want to do that. Then I think they're back to coming up with some sort of plan where they play all their games out West, kind of like we've seen with the, the Jays playing, you know, down in the States or what have you. Maybe that's so logistically complicated though. Uh, that's the kind of thing you would have to do now. I mean, I don't think they're going to throw together a bubble. There's no reason they can't do it. The NFL did it. Some states had fans and some states didn't. I'm not I'm not saying it has to be a bubble. Like I don't think I don't think we have to do the full bubble. I use that term in, in incorrectly, I think, but it it just means that they're playing their home games in a different city. So it, and I don't think they would even call it a home game at that point. Let's say Toronto plays out of Winnipeg or Saskatchewan or whatever, it, it, somewhere where fans are allowed, um, or they schedule they schedule in such a way where the Ontario teams or the East teams don't play each other until the second half of the season, and then they can sort of have a little bit of a wait and see on that part. But until then, all their home games and road games against West teams are played in the West stadiums. Not a bubble, just in that location. I don't see it. I don't see them signing off on that. Who who's going to sign off to be cannon fodder? You think they want the the league the season that badly that they're willing to go on like a ten game road trip to start the season? I I don't think so. I think they want to play. I think that there's a lot of pressure to play now. I I I do, I, I think. I just don't think there's any chance the Eastern teams agree to lose money and go on a 10-game road trip, which means that they're going to get pasted. I just don't think that that's an angle that they're going to accept at all. And there may be some sort of revenue-sharing deal as well if we look at this and we say, okay, well, this is how the setup is going to work. We're going to play all the home games in the West, but the East teams are getting ticket revenue for the games that are supposed to be their home games, something like that. So for a team, for a West team, so for your Saskatchewan's, your Edmonton's, Calgary's, BC's, uh, Winnipeg's, they're taking in twice the gate that they would normally because every game is a home game. But the key is that half of that gate is going to go to those East teams when they come and play. That's not a bad deal suddenly because you're actually getting money. So all of the revenue that's being collected by those teams from the West you can now split that. So the West teams are still getting what they would get anyway, 
But now the East teams are, in some cases, maybe even getting more than they might uh, in a in a normal season because they're getting that West gate. I don't see why you can't come up with some sort of plan like that. <laughs> well, maybe. It, f- it feels very optimistic that they can throw together some kind of plan. I, I think that's all too complicated for them. I think it just will boil down to Ontario teams accept playing at home with no fans or they or they c- kill the season. Let's move on to the positive news because there was some positive news this week. So there are some things that make it feel like we're getting closer. Obviously, the days are ticking down. We're getting close to 70 days until the supposed kickoff date. But players are starting to receive information about training camp dates. Multiple players tweeting that they received a training camp start date uh, from their teams, including Ermin Lane of the Toronto Argonauts tweeted that out. He was pretty excited to get up here. We've had a lot of high-profile players in the league say that they are just about to or have just received their second dose of their vaccine and are planning now to wait two weeks and then travel up to Canada. It just feels like the season is getting closer. We never had any feeling like this last year. There was Obviously, there were no vaccines, but we didn't hear a lot of stories about players starting to make the trip up here, and we are hearing that now. So that was one really positive thing. I love the tweet from Vernon Adams tweeting out his vaccine information with his dates on there saying he can't wait to get up here and start playing. And he's arriving early June, as are a lot of these players that have been spending the offseason either because they live there or because they've traveled down there in the States. They're making plans to get up here for June. So that makes it feel more like we're getting closer to a season two. Yeah, it's excellent. Uh, It's nice to see the enthusiasm for the players and I'm happy for the players. I, I really hope that they're able to put together a season, even if it isn't great, uh, simply for the players who have been so patient and have been working and preparing. And I, I certainly hope that, that we're able to, uh, to do it. And there's some positive news for Argonauts finally getting together in some way. It's in Chicago, but it's still getting together. So yesterday, Jawan Breskison, Tavares Daniels, and Antonio Pipkin all got together to play a little football uh, out there at a high school in the Chicago area. And they got to work right away. Just talking briefly to Jawan Breskison, he said that they went over plays. They wanted to see how they envisioned different things on the field, different concepts. They started building some chemistry. It was pretty light work, sort of a slow pace more. He called it more like teaching sessions, seeing how they break at the top of routes, learning the intricacies of playing with new guys. But what a great opportunity for those three guys down in Chicago, working together on a field. That has got to feel a lot more like you're getting closer. Just thinking about some of these guys, what they've been doing. You know, we've we've seen Dejan Brissett playing catch with his mom in his backyard. And while that's great, that's not the same as you know, getting sideline passes from Antonio Pipkin. And so to see players playing with their own teammates, Argos playing with Argos, makes me feel like we're getting closer. All right, let's talk about the Argonauts defensive back. So last week, we had a pretty easy time with it, looking at the linebackers, because you've got Cameron Judge, you've got Enoch Mwamba, those two are going to start, and it was just sort of filling in who was behind them, who was third string, who's going to play special teams. The defensive backs, when I look at this list of guys, remind me so much more of the defensive line or even the receiver group where you're just like, I have no idea who's going to play anywhere. What do you look at when you when you see all these names, over 20 defensive backs, a new draft pick coming in as well? Where do you start with something like this? It is interesting when you look at the guys that they've invited to camp. It is going to be probably the biggest challenge for the coaching staff to quickly evaluate uh, players and 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 make a decision with probably very little time, and and we'll probably have to make decisions. To be honest, based on online ability, you know how quickly players are able to to pick up the playbook, how how efficient they are in terms of online conversations. I think that's the reality of football now. Is there's probably not going to be a ton of on field evaluation time. Uh, for these players. I mean, there are some really interesting athletes. We talked, it feels like a hundred years ago, but I remember us talking, um, you know, about bring in as many as you can 
and and see what sticks. And I, you know, I really like I really like what they've done in that they've brought in a lot of guys who are very similar, and they're going to keep one and they're going to release the rest. But to to have a number of guys who have the same quality, I think, is a really clever uh, plan for 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 building a, a defense. I'm I'm excited for what they can do, but I do not want to have their job to be able to pick through this group uh, with so little time on the field. It's a clever plan when you have a full training camp. It's it's still I think it's still a good plan either way. But it, yeah, like you say, it's it's so much harder. And add to the fact that really we're fielding for six different spots here because I think other than Jason Beck and, and Jordan Moore, there's probably not going to be a linebacker that's looking to play that cover backer spot. I think we're probably talking about one of the DBs as well. So you're you're trying to slot these 20 something guys into six different defensive back positions and none of them are guys that have only played one spot before. Like you look at all of them, even if you start at the top and say okay, well these are these are our, our best guys. Let's say you think our 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 best guys are Alden Darby and Shaq Richardson and Robertson Daniel. So, well, where do they play? Well, they've played all over the place. Darby's played corner. He's played free safety. Shaq has been the cover backer. He's played field corner. He's played a bit of halfback. Robertson Daniels played absolutely everywhere. So even with those guys, we don't know exactly where to put them. And then when you start looking at these other guys, they're players with a lot less experience, some uh, who have never even played in the CFL before, and you're trying to look at their their American film and say, well, this probably translates pretty well here. So for me, I think the easiest place to start is look at the Canadians. We've got three Canadian defensive backs. I guess I guess we've got four if you count Josh Haggerty, the recent draft pick from Saskatchewan, who I, I don't think is is going to be in the mix this year. I expect him to go back to school for for one more year, like I was saying on on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. So I don't feel like he's in the mix here. So that leaves us with Arjun Cahoon, Matt Boateng, and Rob Woodson. And I think I really can't see any situation where they're not all going to be playing the same spot. I just think that makes the most sense. I feel like there needs to be one Canadian DB spot. It's not absolutely mandatory. We do have the numbers to make it work, but... I think that's probably the way to go. So that likely becomes field corner, and that is now taken care of. As far as who wins that battle, I think that's probably Cahoon's to lose. He's got the most, I wouldn't say the most CFL experience. We saw Woodson play a lot, actually, in 2019. But I think Cahoon had a more successful showing in in 2019. Woodson had some really bad luck. He got lined up against Burnham that one game in BC and it just didn't go well for him. They just found a way to to continuously give him these these really awkward matchups that didn't suit his skill set. And whereas Cahoon in some limited playing time actually really showed what he could do, what made him such a good player at Michigan State. Boateng may have the highest ceiling of those three guys, but we just haven't seen him on the field enough yet. He just didn't get enough playing time in 2019. So I think those three guys battle it out. I think it'll be a fantastic camp battle and maybe one that continues throughout the entire season. But I think that's the field corner spot locked up. Now, what do we do about cover backer? You've got guys like Mike Tyson, uh, Sample, I guess we have to consider as, as a potential cover backer, Robertson, Daniel. What do you make of that spot? Yeah, uh, I, honestly, I'm pretty intrigued. Um, I have to say that I was I was really excited by the Tyson film. Um, he was a sixth round pick in Seattle, uh, so obviously, if you're drafted into the NFL, you check the measurables box. Um, he he played for a couple of different teams on practice squads and had some injury issues. But um, wow, when you watch his his college tape. Um, it's hard not to to fall in love with him. Um, he's fast. He hits like a ton. He actually has decent hips and uh, and and good hands um, in terms of being able to do coverage down the field. Uh, you know, uh, I'm I'm really excited. I think if if he can be close to that, um, I would. I think he's he's fantastic. He's my he's my favorite. 
Uh, Robertson Daniel, of course, I think is the favorite in that he's already been in the league. He played with Calgary. Um, you know, he's a professional. He looks, he looks good. He's fluid. Um, he also can hit like a ton. Um, he, the coaches will love him. I think he'll be the favorite to, to make the team. He'll look the smoothest and the most ready. Um, and then, uh, you know, Er, you and I have talked about off air. Erman Lane is the most interesting, maybe the most interesting uh, prospect the Argos invited to camp. Uh, that he, you know, a former wide receiver and uh, you know much ballyhooed and was really one of the top wide receivers recruited uh, down in Florida. And he's six three, two oh five, changed over to to safety linebacker um, played behind Derwin James and, you know, raw <laughs> and a wild card, but obviously an absolute elite athlete and, you know, played well against Alabama who are as good as anybody in the world, obviously. And, you know, had six tackles in, you know, that's pretty tough competition didn't didn't really get a look at the NFL. I guess they they weren't crazy about not having tons of film at wide receiver or at at safety for him. But I, I love the I love the potential of having somebody that that big that fast who is knowledgeable about wide receiver, played the position, knows the tricks, knows the routes, as well as having played with Derwin James. Um, I, I'm really excited to see what it looks like on film. I think he could be an absolute steal. I pray that whatever spot the Argos have in mind for him right now, they keep him there and don't move him. <laughs> yeah. This poor guy, yeah. like you said, like his story is crazy. The, the number two receiving prospect in the entire country coming out of high school and he commits to Florida and then changes his mind, goes to Florida State, and the, and the whole country was into that story because they're so excited to see Ermin Lane, the wide receiver, and then suddenly he ends up going over to the defensive side of the ball. He played some he played some D in high school as well, and then he looked really good there. Florida State needed a little bit of depth there as well. And this poor guy going from position to position, it felt like every week there was something new he was trying to learn. And they just t- squashed his opportunities for such a tremendous athlete. So I think the worst thing that could happen to him is for him to come up here and them to say, all right, you're going to play the cover backer spot. And then two weeks later, let's try you at free. So he's got to, he's got to be in one of those two places. I like him at free, but I also like Alden Darby at free. And so I don't know, that's, that's a tough one. And, you know, then if we're going to play him at the cover backer spot, great. I like him there too, but I also really like, James Sample in that cover backer spot. I really like Mike Tyson in either of those two spots. I wasn't as crazy about Sample, but but you know, I mean, it, that you know, that's that's a preference. Uh, it, it's really hard to tell. Like, I wish I wish I had more film on Lane, you know, playing defensively. But but like you say, there was so much jumping around. I think that really hurt his shot at 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 making the NFL because there just wasn't great film and there was a lot of question marks and 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 that's hard to switch a position um to and be, and to be elite at it um so he of them all i mean i think you know what you're getting with the other three i think you know tyson and daniel and sample are all going to be uh good you know they're they're they are experienced guys who have been in nfl camps and you know they're they're going to go out there and they're going to look good that's not going to be easy for lane to beat them um, you know, Lane is going to have to to flash a little bit. He he has more size on them, more height. If he can really show a better coverage ability than the other guys, maybe he has a shot at that. The other guys that will sort of fill out the rest of the defensive backfield. It's it's a this whole thing is is a little bit of a crapshoot. But uh, I really like Chris Humes. Just watching some of his film, his Arkansas State stuff, I, I thought was excellent. We didn't get to see a ton of his his play in Winnipeg, but man, he's a really, really good corner uh, in Arkansas State. Now, I don't see him playing corner up here, though. And I know in Winnipeg, they tried him out 
um, in, in a couple of different places. He, he, he played a significant amount of time at, uh, uh, in the, the field half. And so I think that's probably at least where they start him. But I think he's definitely got enough skill to be able to to start for the Argos at, at week half. I think Jeff Richards is on the field somewhere. That's probably uh, at the other halfback spot. Shaq Richardson might be the best player in our defensive backfield. Uh, I know he really likes playing boundary corner. And so that's sort of how I've pictured him. But he as well has played some cover backer uh, even out in Calgary. And so that's something that Coach Dinwiddie's seen him do. So don't be surprised if he ends up playing that cover backer spot and now somebody else gets a shot at boundary corner. Maybe that's Chris Humes. Maybe that's Robertson Daniel and they sort of switch spots. D- Daniel, t- to me, strikes me as the most able to to be able to move back and forth between the two where, where Tyson and Sample and Lane, I think, are cover backer or bust. I could see Lane playing free a sample less so. I, I really think that just the way that the way that Erman Lane sees the ball, uh, I think makes for a free safety. He actually reminds me a little bit of of watching Darby and why Darby is is such a a good free safety. That's maybe not a natural spot for him. I know the the plan was always for Darby to play corner, but he ends up playing some free, and they never looked back because he he was so good at it. And I see that with Lane a little bit too. I think his experience. Just like Darby played a lot of offense. Well, to be honest, a ton of these guys played on the offensive side of the ball in in high school too. But Darby was a prolific offensive football player. And I think that helped him uh, as a free safety who could see these concepts take uh, shape in front of him. He knew when to gamble, knew when to to jump in and make a play. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a little bit of that from Ehrman Lane as well. And, and I do think Mike Tyson will, will battle for that free spot. But there's going to be all sorts of flexibility with all these names here. Yeah, it's true. T- Tyson does impress with, you, you think he looks like just a box guy, but then you, you watch his film in open field and, you know, he, he's got great flexibility. He can get down the field. He can cover, um, you know, that, that's true. There is a possibility that he, he might, in a pinch, uh, go back there too. Like, he, he certainly built like a box and he hits like a box but uh what i guess what really excited me about the film was just how fluid he was down the field so i think just given how this season is going to be so unusual we're not probably going to have a full camp we probably aren't going to have preseason games and that being the case i wouldn't be surprised if the coaches sort of err on the side of cfl experience so if that's the case you're going to get Robertson Daniel, a cover backer. You're going to get Cahoon and Shaq probably as your two corners. You're probably going to get either... Uh, Kristen Butler is another guy that that probably... I think he's got a really good shot of finding his way into the football field. He's had, He's got so much experience. So maybe it's he or Humes on one side, and maybe it's Jeff Richards or, or, or Glenn maybe on the other side, and then Darby at free. Some combination of those guys playing in the defensive backfield. And then we have to hope that the Argos find a way to keep guys like Tyson, like Sample, in my opinion. I love watching Sample's film. I know we're not we're not necessarily seeing him the exact same way, but guys like him, because there are so many that probably aren't going to get to start. Tristan Decoot, another guy who I love at corner, and I think he's probably going to learn the ropes a little bit behind Shaq. But yeah, his film at Oregon State is unbelievable. And so... If you can keep some of those guys and then throughout the course of the season when there are injuries, because we know there are inevitably going to be, those guys get an opportunity to step in after getting some practice reps. I I think this defensive backfield could be outstanding by the end of the season. Yeah, my hope is that the coaching, because there's often a disconnect uh, between coaching staffs and management and coaches are often very conservative and risk adverse, and they want the guy who's going to be able to do the job uh, with the least amount of work to get him to do the job. That's kind of a natural coaching predilection. M- my hope is that the coaching staff is as open to the potential of all of these guys in the same way that management was when they brought them in because they saw it. Okay, here's a guy who might not, you know, be the perfect fit for a perfect position or have all the CFL experience, but is an elite athlete, is a good person, and is somebody that we think could really learn and become great. 
And I really hope that the coaching staff is on the same page with that. But that's it's hard to do because it's risky and it means, you know, sometimes failure, you know, and that's why sometimes guys don't get a fair shake. Um, and so a guy like Lane, I hope I hope the coaching staff is as ambitious as management was for bringing him in. I agree. But like you say, it's so easy to say, but when it's you as the coach and your yeah. job is on the line and you're like, well, this guy's probably my, my best answer, but we may lose the first three games in order for us to see it. <laughs> it's, it's not as easy a call. So we'll, no. we'll see how that goes. But yeah, some of those names, like, like we're saying, like Ermin Lane, man, I hope he gets an opportunity. Mike Tyson, same thing. James Sample, same thing. Tristan Decoud. I, I want to see those four guys get a shot. I'm not sure if they will, uh, but I'm excited uh, for the possibility that we get to see those guys on the football field. And if not, you know, I'm really, I'm, I'm excited about the guys we have in front of them right now on my, on my depth chart. So yeah, I, I don't know if it can go wrong. Well, that will just about do it for us on this week's episode of the X's and Argos podcast. But before we go, we've got to leave a quick shout out to Estonia. That's right. The X's and Argos podcast we're ranked the number two football podcast in all of Estonia. For those of you listening in Estonia, thank you so much. And uh, we appreciate your, your listenership. I believe we're number 12 in Hungary. We are crushing it in other parts of the world, JB. We, we, def we definitely are. And I am I'm glad that Estonia is on board. <laughs> For JB, my name is Ben Grant saying so long. And may all your pre-snap reads be good ones. I'll see ya.